Welcome to the Transitioning from Fellowship to Faculty, Tips and Tricks from the Experts, Day 2 webinar. Today's session is the second of two webinars on career development and will cover job offers through negotiating contracts and be followed by a gallery Q&A discussion. This session was developed by AST's Training and Young Faculty Community of Practice and is proudly supported by the AST Fellows Planning Committee and the AST Education Committee. AST would like to take a moment to send out a special welcome to all Fellows 2022 Symposium attendees, as well as all current and future TYFCOP members in our audience today. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the session over to Dr. Lair to begin our presentation. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of the AST and the Training and Young Faculty Community of Practice for attending our webinar, Transitioning from Fellowship to Faculty. We've been very excited to bring this content to our members, and we'd like to thank all of our presenters here and our fellow moderators and AST staff for their help putting this together. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Vanita Kumar uh, for her talk on etiquette and managing multiple offers. Great. Thank you, Carly. Um, and hi, everybody. Delighted to be here. And um, before we jump into the actual talk, um, let me show you my conflicts of interest disclosure. And since this is sort of an educational hour, the one thing I learned was for a conflict of interest slide to be relevant, it needs to be up for six seconds. So this is why I'm talking. These are my six seconds here now for you, but I have no uh, relevant financial relationships to disclose. So we have um, a lineup today of uh, three talks. I'll go first and then It'll be followed by Dr. Tanna and then Dr. Cotton. And I, like you, can't wait to hear about Dr. Tanna and Cotton talk. Um, so let's get started with my talk, Etiquette and Managing Multiple Offers. What does that mean? Let's set the stage here, yeah? So you heard um, Dr. Levitsky's talk from the first session, and you know how to put together a great resume. You sent it out, and then you got interviews, yay. And you heard from Dr. Kittleson how to really do a good interview. You did really well in your interviews because now you have an offer. How fantastic is this? So if you have an offer, you're probably feeling really happy. And then so you now start to think about, well, what about the other offer? Oh, I have a second offer, but I'm waiting for the third offer. And so now suddenly you go from a state of being happy to, hmm, how do I manage all these multiple offers? And while it's an enviable position to be in, it can also make things complicated when you're juggling multiple things. And what you, why is it complicated? Why can it be stressful? Recognize that you're in a place of high emotion as you navigate this maze, and you still want to continue to be the best version of yourself during this time. You know, even if you have the offer, you're waiting for another, or you're entertaining too. It's a small world. People talk. Talk. Um, this is where communicating appropriately and with appropriate etiquette comes in. So that's where the title of etiquette in communication. So what is etiquette? Etiquette refers to typically conventions and norms of social behavior. And we're all familiar when we go out to dinner, we're given a fork and a knife and a plate. And, you know, there are different positions they can be in. And what does it mean? We don't have to make all this that complicated when it comes to communicating with each other, interpersonal communication. How? What are some of the codes of conduct that you can do this with respect uh, during this time? And, you know, a simple thing is when you are in person with somebody interviewing, you make eye contact that you are told that that's a, an appropriate social norm, um, but it may not be everybody's cup of tea. Um, there's also uh, things you need to do when you're interacting with people through email or in between interviews. And so here are some tips for staying calm through this potentially uh, nerve wracking decision making process. It's essentially four big buckets, and I'm going to talk about each one of those, starting with with what does get all your facts mean, followed by expressing enthusiasm, managing timing, what timing, and then what do you do at the time that you've made a decision? So facts matter, right? We know that. And um, Dr. Thunna is actually going to help you think through which 
job is the right fit for you. So without overlapping with her, I just wanted to mention that there are three big buckets you want to think about. Um, when you have an offer in hand and you're trying to decide if this is the right one for you, get all your basic facts down, right? Those are common for everything. Base compensation, bonus, calls, hours, additional requirements, benefits. Then figure out what you value most. So look at each opportunity and then also have a list of what your value systems are and how they align with each of these opportunities. And you don't want to forget the little things, right? Things like what's the commute like? What's the dress code like? What are, are there any perks? Like there's a workout session, the a center very close to this uh, medical center, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I mean by getting all your facts together. Now, at the time that you have your first offer, either through email or when you're called verbally, uh, what is the appropriate etiquette there? Without doubt, and this is something that uh, Epstein Schwartz, and I have the reference down here for you, um, uh, all, all the qualitative analysis interviews that have been done around this, that I've talked to people who made offers or people who've gotten offers, um, the one common thing is expressing excitement and appreciation for the offer that's been made to you. So if you have an attractive offer, the first thing to do is to do this, express an excitement, express appreciation without actually saying yes. So things like, I'm so honored that you would make this offer or how wonderful is it to hear this? The next step is when you express that, after you express that appreciation, you also want to identify when the employer expects a final decision. When would you like to know by my final decision? Um, you also want to, again, our, in our effort to be pleasers, some of those who, some of us who are afflicted with that, um, you may want, feel like you have to say or accept on the spot. If you are considering other offers, you definitely want to just resist that urge unless you know absolutely sure this is your dream job and even if then I would say take your time just find out from the employer when they expect that final decision um, you know most employers do not expect you to accept immediately they're really accepting expecting enthusiasm probably some follow-up questions so how do you the question then becomes channel this enthusiasm into honest and authentic communication here's an example so you could use something like this um, if when you've you've been made an offer and you can say, thank you. I'm so excited to receive your offer. I believe this position is an excellent fit for me at this point in my career. When do you need to know my official decision? I'll give this my utmost attention and get back to you by Wednesday. So you've expressed enthusiasm, you've asked for the timeline, and you've also sort of said, this might be the time uh, line that I could give you an answer back. Um, you know, I have to point out this quote, Edgar Allan Poe is one of my favorite people where he says there is an eloquence in um, expressing true enthusiasm. The next thing is managing your time. You know, you have an offer that might be an offer you like, but you're really waiting for this another offer. How do you manage this? All time management begins with planning is what Tom Greening tells us. So what is it? Waiting for another offer is a tricky situation. And you want to remember that in receiving the offer is only the beginning. While you are waiting, you want to take the time to see if the other potential second offer is coming through. You can ask about benefits, ask to speak or meet with additional people at that time. Um, if you're in a situation where you will need additional time to respond, be honest, be positive. Should I mention the other position? Again, this data shows that yes, for the most part, transparency is best. Most employers view such a candidate favorably as they're clearly in high demand. If you have two offers, you are somebody that everybody is trying to recruit, which is excellent. Um, and then if you have an offer, but you don't, but you're waiting for the other one to come along, it is not quite coming along and you really want this um, and you're running out of time, don't be afraid to approach the other offers employer. Let them know you've received another offer that you'd appreciate it if they could expedite the hiring process. And again, wording is key here, appropriate word choice 
goes a long way. So what could these words be? Let's have a quick look. I'm, in the interest of time, I won't read both of them, but let me just look. have you look through the first one. In mentioning the other offer, you can say something like, I'm so excited that you've offered me this opportunity. I believe that I can make a very strong contribution in this role and would enjoy the work immensely. I have a very favorable interview at another institution, and I believe an offer may be pending shortly. Though I'm strongly inclined towards your position, I would be most comfortable if I could make a comparative choice. Is there any chance you could give me until next Wednesday to finalize my acceptance? Here's the other uh, statement, and you can read this on your own about how do you try to get the, uh, the second offer or the third offer you're waiting for to respond back to you. So again, the point here is what this cartoon says, which is really managing energy during this time, both yours and the other parties is more important than actually managing the time. Decision time. Once you made your decision, act promptly and graciously, especially if you're declining an offer, because declining an offer is essentially saying no to somebody. It's like rejecting somebody else. So we don't, we're not wired for rejecting others. Others are not wired to take that rejection. So this is the time where you want to first call your contact, if possible, and let them know that you're not going with their offer. First, thank them for their time and practice and be prepared to give them a reason for turning down the offer. Remember, don't uh, this is the time you don't want to burn any bridges because you never know what the future may hold. You may be wanting a job offer from them or somebody from there, maybe somebody that may write a letter for you one day. You never know. And in accepting a decision, it's a happy time. You made your decision. Dr. Tana has told you what to look for. And there are also some etiquette things you want to watch out for. Uh, you want to return your executed offer letter promptly. Again, express your appreciation and excitement. If they want additional materials, and this is where you're actually going to be work with program manager people and the administrative staff. And believe me, they become really important in um, how you present yourself for the rest of the time that you're there. Um, and then the final thing I might say is that um, in, in expressing your positivity and excitement, also negotiate the start date. Um, I will say that for my own self, I did take some time off between my fellowship and uh, my faculty year. And if it's possible for you, if you think about doing it, it's a great idea. This is my final slide. I'll let you read it. But uh, what I want you to remember is that if you are always respectful and gracious and use the right words, that's what really etiquette is all about in its highest potential. This is where words are not only reflections of life, but inspirations for life, something I try to remember. And with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Tana, if you want to come on screen and can't wait to hear from you and Dr. Cotton next. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, so I'm going to be talking about tips to determine if a program is the right fit. Um, I'm currently the medical director of transplant infectious diseases um, at Inova Heart and Vascular Institute. Um, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. So before we start talking about if the program is the right fit, I think we need to talk about you and what you're looking for. Um, this is a chart that I really like from my friend and mentor, Diane Wayne, at um, the Fine School of Medicine at Northwestern. Um, and it's very simple. It's um, you, you list three goals on the left, and your columns are where are you now, where do you want to be, and key contacts and mentors. Um, I think most of you might pursue a job in academia, and if that's the case, one of your goals does need to be academic promotion. Um, I think it would be a good idea to fill this out and go over it with your mentor, and then come back to it year in year after year to see the progress that you've made um, of where you are now and where you want to be. The other thing that you need to do is figure out what your deal breakers are. Write down the things that are you have to have to be happy, and then write down the things that will actively make you unhappy. Um, write down the things that you really want in a job and be brutally honest with yourself. So for me, about six years ago when I was graduating fellowship, I knew I wanted to take care of patients and be primarily clinical. I wanted to be at an academic center. I really wanted to live in a major city. Um, for ID, I, one of the big things is I really wanted to take care of all stem cell transplants and solid organ transplants. I didn't want to just um, confine my practice to one organ so early on in my career. Um, it was really important for me to identify a strong mentor off the bat. Um, and then I 
pick the minimum salary that I thought seemed reasonable for the cost of living in wherever city I was going to end up. I don't think your ultimate job has to include every single item on your list, but it does force you to have some objective criteria so that when you get these very attractive offers, that you have something to come back to and think about what am I looking for. Um, once you have your list, talk to your current mentors, get their feedback, see how realistic it is. They might bring up pros and cons that you might not have thought about. Um, mentors are really great because they can also know about job openings that they've heard about that might fit your goals. I think that as a trainee, especially if you've been at the same institution for a long period of time, it can be really hard to know how to connect with other people outside of your institution. Um, so your mentor or program director can be a really great resource to connect you to other people in your field who might have the same vision of a career that you do. And then in, in general, just like Dr. Kumar said, it's a very small community. And so mentors can have inside information about programs and why people have left and um, think about programs that might be a good fit for you. Okay, so now you've looked for a program applied. What are we looking for? I think mentorship is key. Um, I think it's especially important if you're starting at a new place um, that you didn't train at. Um, you wanna identify both research and clinical mentorship. Um, I think it's important to ask about formal opportunities within your own section, but also within whether you're in the Department of Medicine or Department of Surgery, so that you have people to collaborate with for research and for, uh, for clinical studies. Um, you know, I, I think that they often have you meet on the interview day with the uh, most senior faculty members, but I think it's really key to talk to the folks who have been most recently hired, ask about their experiences with mentorship, any hurdles and challenges they experienced trying to get a lay of the land and establish their own practice um, at that place. Another big thing to look at is um, how promotion and leadership uh, happens. I think when you're looking at the website, are faculty being promoted? Are they mostly all instructors? How, how long are they staying at instructor or assistant professor? Um, look at not only if there's diversity um, in color and in men and women um, in the division, but also who's in division leadership. Um, are the junior faculty be, being given leadership roles within the division? Um, Talk to the newly hired faculty and people with similar backgrounds as you about their experiences with promotion. Um, and then since I've just actually just transitioned out of academia, um, it's important to ask about how will your success be measured um, if there isn't the, just the normal academic promotion. Um, clinical responsibilities, go back to your list of goals and remember you need to leave time to achieve them. Um, be realistic about your initial commitment of inpatient time and call and clinic days. What I've learned is that it's so much easier to say, hey, I wanna do another half day of clinic or I need a couple more weeks of service than to commit to it and then try to pull back. Um, another thing that's really important is to ask about the type of support that you'll receive. Um, what's the clinic staff like, pharmacy, advanced practice providers, fellows. I, I think it's just a really exciting time, but know that um, burnout is very real and you really wanna be proactive about protecting your peace, not over committing too early. Um, salary is really actually very important. Um, I think it's something that we didn't ever really have to think about because we all kind of got the same stipend and uh, residency and fellowship, but we all have financial obligations. A lot of you are going to have to pay off your loans, your mortgage, your childcare. Um, think about what a, a reasonable salary range is and then, you know, adjust for cost of living depending on where um, each program is located. I found that it was very uncomfortable to discuss salaries. Um, so the way I approached it, six years ago was I asked my fellowship program director about what a normal starting salary at our institution was. Um, and then I asked other people the same question. And I felt like it was much easier for people to communicate that with me because I wasn't specifically asking them, how much do you make? Um, a lot of people had warned me that I was going to have to uh, define what the salary was that I wanted or what I expected. Honestly, that I, it just hasn't ever happened for me. I think usually the budget is set, the salary is set by either the de Department of Medicine or Surgery, um, but you do wanna look at the whole offer. Is there a guaranteed bonus? How long is that for? Um, does your uh, clinical productivity affect your base salary? Can your base salary actually go down? These are really important questions to ask. Um, and then when you look at the entire salary package, you want to look and see if there's a signing bonus. Are they including moving expenses? Is there a retention bonus? Are you going to get CME money? Are they going to contribute to your retirement? Because um, all of that really does add up. And then, you know, 
I think this is probably the most important thing is your personal goals and, and your work-life balance. Um, how supportive is the division of family obligations? What are they offering for maternity and parental leave? How do they respond to healthcare worker burnout during the pandemic? Um, how many weekends and holidays are you going to have to work? How much time off are you going to get? Think about the things that really matter to you and ask about the culture there. And then trust your gut. Um, you know, you really need to pay attention to how you feel during the interview process. Don't ignore any red flags that you note. Um, I think if you can talk to the people who have left and their experiences and why they left and people who aren't stakeholders in you getting this job, um, you will get really valuable information. Um, I think we often uh, sell ourselves short, especially coming straight out of fellowship. And I think that if this is your perfect job, except for one thing, ask for that, mention it. Um, choose a program that you think they're really um, invested in you and your career development. Um, and then lastly, I think it's really important to assume that if it's not explicitly listed in your letter of intent or contract, that it won't actually happen. Um, so if something is really important to you, make sure you get that in writing. And then lastly, you know, this is my last slide. Um, Sometimes the right fit becomes a little less right. And I think it's okay if you need to leave in a few years because your goals or priorities have changed, but you should keep it classy, keep it professional um, and amicable. Um, I think it's really important to pay close attention to your non-compete clause given this possibility, especially if you wanna stay in one city or area. And I think Dr. Cotton will tell us a little bit more about that and negotiating your contract. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Tana. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I started my career as an internist. I've been a lawyer for about 25 years, and every year I help several hundred physicians with their job situation. So I share my perspective uh, as an attorney, and it lines up very nicely with what Dr. Kumar and Dr. Tana have already shared. I've got uh, seven bullet points here uh, to help you out there when you're negotiating. The first one is, and let me get my slides to work here. The first one is, that the job has to be personally and professionally satisfying to you, or the contract doesn't matter, don't bother looking at it, it's not a fit for you, and the job is not going to work. If you walk out of the place and you, and you say, well, I, I really can't see myself here, I don't think there's a growth opportunity, the way they've set up their department isn't a fit for me, there's not enough mentors here, I don't like the location, I don't want to live in this town, then the contract is irrelevant. Uh, there's none of those things can be fixed by uh, by adding or adjusting something in the contract. So the most important thing in negotiation is to always make sure you're starting with an opportunity that has the potential to be fulfilling to you personally and professionally. And if it doesn't, then the job's not a fit, and the contract doesn't matter. And it really doesn't matter what the pay is because the even if they pay you a substantial amount of money, ultimately, it's not going to be a long-term fit for you because you're not going to be happy there. Two, once you've decided that this job is a good fit for you, the purpose of the negotiation is to maximize the opportunity. You want to make the most of this opportunity. Now, how much are you going to be able to improve it? I don't have the slightest idea. You might be able to improve it in 10 areas by a significant amount. You might not be able to improve it a single inch, but you don't want to sign it before you're sure that you've maximized it. One of the biggest disappointments I run into with physicians is they accepted something. They said, what's well, pretty good. I'm just a fellow. I shouldn't really ask. I don't want to offend anybody. So I just signed it. And then a year later, I found out they brought somebody else in comparable credentials to me. And they gave them a lot more than they gave me. And the reason is, of course, that person probably asked and you didn't. But it sets you up now, all of a sudden, the job you like, now you're unhappy because you feel like you're being treated unfairly. Don't put yourself in that position. If you maximize the opportunity and you sign the contract, you can proceed forward knowing that you made the most of it. And whatever else somebody else did, that's on them. That's their, their decisions, their contract. But I made the most of this opportunity for me. That sets you up for satisfaction rather than disappointment. Three, how do you maximize the opportunity? You start from the very first interaction. 
there's a belief. I hear people say, well, you know, I don't like negotiation. They say, I don't like it. Most physicians don't. Uh, Dr. Tana said, you know, I don't like to talk about salary. I don't, I don't like to get into that stuff. I, I'd encourage you to look at this differently. Negotiation is not a process where at some point a person rings a bell and we go at each other for five minutes and then they ring the bell and the negotiation's over and we're pretty beat up, but hopefully we got something to show for it. That's not how negotiation works. If you're good at this, if you're smooth, you weave the negotiation into the whole interaction. It's you, you show up the first interaction, your first interview, you're there, you just show up and they start showing you the place and they say, well, we have these clinics and then we have some other clinics, you know, half an hour away or an hour away. And I would right there say, okay, well, which of these clinics would I be going to? And they say, well, you're new. So we'd probably send you, you know, to the far away ones for a while. Okay, well, I, I don't particularly want to do that. So I would say, well, you know, I'm okay with doing my share. Are you, are you okay if I just do an equal amount of outreach to everybody else? Would that, would that be fair with you? And the person would say, yeah, okay, I see your point. I just negotiated. It should be easy like that. It should be easy. The subject of salary comes up. And they say, well, they're, they're offering you this and you think it's a little low. You say, well, that, that's a little lower than I was expecting. Do you, do you have any room on that? Can, can we improve that? Or are you, are you open to increasing that? You can be friendly about it. it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't wind up beating each other up. If that's what you're doing, it, it's not a good negotiation. It's a bad sign for the relationship because these are people you're going to have to work with and stuff is going to come up after there's three months or six months or four years. You're going to have to resolve that. If you guys are going to beat each other up every time there's an issue, this relationship is not headed in a good direction, okay? So negotiate smoothly. Start from the beginning. Take every interaction. When they tell you something, weigh it relative to what you're expecting and ask friendly questions about, is it, well, can I do more inpatient? I, I don't want to spend that much time. Just do it on the fly and, and, and work it into the conversation. It's so much easier. The other people won't even, they'll like you. They'll think this is a really good person to work with. I, I like her approach. I like his approach. Easy to talk to, easy to solve problems with. That's, the, that's, that's what a good candidate should convey. In order to be successful with this, and, and I believe Dr. Kumar mentioned this, you have to start by ranking your priorities and knowing exactly what you want. This is the most important part. Don't interact with potential employers until you know what's important to you. It might be money. It might be amount of uh, special. You want to do all transplants. You want to do a bunch of inpatients. You don't want to do outreach. You want time for research. You know, what are your priorities? I mean, ideally, we'd all like everything. But that's not how life works. So when you're having these conversations and you run into this little glitch about, well, you know, they want you to do some outreach, you might have to say, well, I tell you what, I, I'm okay with doing a little more outreach initially, but can, in return, can you do this for me? Can I have this? Again, you're trading off a lower ranking thing in exchange for something that matters to you. If you go into the discussion without knowing what your priorities are, it's very hard to come out and know if you don't even know if you're successful. You have to go home and say, I don't know if I was successful or not because I didn't know what I wanted. You're setting yourself up for failure by doing, <clears throat> by doing that. You also have to know exactly what you want. So when an issue of... Um, you know, inpatient and weeks on inpatient service, when that comes up, you, you might ask questions, say, well, like about how much inpatient would I have to do? And they say, well, that, they say, you got to do 12 weeks. And you're thinking, okay, well, that's a little much. You say, well, you know, that seems a little much. It, it won't give me enough time for some of these other things. Are, are, are you open to, to decreasing that? And the person might say, yeah, yeah, okay, what are you looking for? You have to have the answer ready. If you're going to bring it up, you have to say, I'm willing to do eight weeks. You have to say that. It, you don't want to say, well, could you do less inpatient? And they say, yeah. And they say, what do you think? What are you thinking? And you're like, well, I don't know. I, I didn't really know. I mean, I was just kind of wondering, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Okay. If you, if you want something, know what it is and know what you want. If you want a bigger signing bonus and they ask you what you're looking for, you have to tell them. Otherwise, it looks like you don't really want it. And some of the stuff you have to practice in front of a mirror to be able to, to say these things because they don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to seem pushy. But if you're, if you're not definitive, if, if you don't assert your position, then you don't, you, you, you don't really know what you want. And 
I can probably give you less as a result. So know what your priorities are. And if you want research time, ask for it. How much do you want? Have the answer ready. I want one day a week. Be ready to give those answers. Otherwise, you're selling yourself short as a negotiator. Always negotiate from agreement and toward agreement. And uh, I think both Dr. Kumar and Dr. Tana mentioned this. Um, uh, we, we, there's a belief out there that negotiation should be more like a poker game where we don't tell the other person what our position is. And I've had clients say to me, I don't want to give away my position. I don't want them to know what I'm thinking. Okay, I'll give away your position. You're looking for a job, okay? And I'll give away their position. They're looking to hire someone, okay? So that's your position. And there's nothing to hide here. Again, this is not a poker game where it's a one-time transaction. We try to trick or bluff the person. Those techniques are out. The techniques here are, are transparency, honesty, and being direct with people. And please compliment them. Everybody likes to be complimented. A negotiation is about drawing the other person toward you so that you meet somewhere in the middle. Don't do frontal assaults on people. That makes it so difficult. Dr. Tana talked about, she said, she don't, I don't like to bring up money. Um, if you do it as a frontal assault, it's very hard to do. For example, one negotiating technique would be to, to really gather yourself and then say something like, um, Hey, I really appreciate this offer. Um, the salary is a little lower than I was hoping. Can you increase it by $50,000? Okay, that's tough to say. And if I'm on the receiving end, it's tough to receive because I wasn't expecting it. And secondly, even if I give you that 50, does that get me anything? Are you going to sign? Or are you just going to say, okay, well, thank you. I got a couple other things. So the second thing I have is, and, and I give you that, and then you got a third thing and you got a fourth thing. But like, where are you? Every time I take a step forward, you back up. You're not drawing me towards you. You're running away from me and I'm chasing you. That's not good negotiation. You want to tell the other person where you are. It makes it so much easier. Rather than doing a frontal assault on me for 50,000 bucks, it's so much smoother to say something like, Victor, you know, th thank you so much for uh, the opportunity. I, I, I'm really excited. I think I could see myself spending a long time here uh, in your program. Um, I looked at the contract and the other documents. Um, I think they're everything's fantastic. I just have a couple questions about the compensation and if we can work that out, um, I'm good to go. You see how much easier that was? You told me it's a great program. You told me you liked it. You told me you liked me. And you didn't work that in there too. But I'm not saying butter people up, but draw me towards you. Let me know we're close. You just have a couple questions. Well, what are your questions? Let's get this done. And then you could say, well, the salary is a little lower. If you can raise it 50,000 bucks and we can adjust the amount of uh, outreach I have to do, I'm good to go. So much smoother, so much easier to do it that way. Don't do frontal assaults on people. It, it's not effective and it's incredibly difficult for both parties. Six, do not openly compare offers in front of the other person. This is, many physicians are tempted to do this. You have two offers. So you have one from you know down the road somewhere, and today somebody else made you a different offer. And these two people, they're competitors. You know, you're in Cleveland. You got you got Case Western, and you got Cleveland Clinic, and you interviewed at both of them. And you're gonna try to pit them against each other. So you say to the person, you say, "Well, I tell you what, I appreciate your offer, but you know, here's an offer from you know your competitor. I'm not gonna show you who it was, but as you can see, yours is lower. That doesn't work. Okay, don't do that. It's offensive." You're not drawing me towards you. You're saying you don't measure up. You're not, you're not, those other people, they're better than you are. That doesn't befriend me. That doesn't make me feel warm. That doesn't make me say, well, let me see what I can do to please you. I'd like to work this out. You're hoping what I say is, well, thank you. I'd like to raise my offer right now. But that's not what I do because you offended me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to dig in. I'm going to dig in. I'm going to justify my position. I'm going to say, yeah, I know they pay more, but they're going to work you a lot harder. Nobody lasts there. Their burnout rate is incredible. That we have, I have faculty calling me every day begging me for a job. Everybody hates that place. That's what I'm going to say. And then what do you say? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, that's a dead end argument. Okay, don't do that because it offends people. It, viola it violates that from agreement and towards agreement. When you do this, you're, just, you're, you're offending the person. Don't do that. Compare them at home. And then come back. Sometimes you could do it softly. You could say, hey, I know every job is different, but your salary is a little lower than some of the other ones I've seen. I, I'm, there, there might be, I might be missing something here, but is there any room to increase this? Do it that way. 
Don't say, you know, you're not as good as my last girlfriend. People don't like that. Don't expect everything. You know, you rank your priorities. Hopefully you come away with the key ones and maybe you pick up a few of the minor ones. But you want to show people you're reasonable and flexible as well. Remember, this is a long-term relationship. And, and people want to see that you're not, you're not high maintenance, that you don't expect everything to revolve around you. Those can push the other person away a little bit. You want to show you're willing to compromise as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. We'd like to welcome uh, our moderators back, Dr. Farouk and Dr. Lair, to begin our Q&A. Uh, thanks, Brian. And thanks all of our presenters for those outstanding presentations. I feel inspired to apply for a job and negotiate a contract. Uh, so a couple questions um, in the Q&A so far. Um, and I think I won't direct this any one particular person. I think it would be great to hear different thoughts. I'm seeking a position as a physician scientist in hepatology and as a trainee have essentially been blind um, or naive to the costs of things. What are your recommendations on target amounts for startup funding as a predominant researcher? So maybe we'll start with uh, Sajal. I've predominantly been clinical, so I'm probably not the best answer and person to answer this one. All right, Benita, want to give it a shot? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Amira. So um, I think when you when we don't know something, the best thing is to ask, and it's to go to trusted sources. Um, there are plenty of trusted sources around you, and maybe you know we fear disappointment, so we may not reach out to them. But for more often than not, when you ask a question of others, it's a gift you give to them, asking their help. So with that preamble, what I would say is that one of the points that you brought up, Dr. Tana, which was wonderful, is you asked your fellowship director for a clinical salary. What is an appropriate starting salary for a clinical hepatologist? I would probably do the same thing in the research realm with the, the division director for research and ask them, what do you think is the appropriate salary? In the clinical realm, there's the NGMA um, salary means that is public knowledge. You can go online, a type of MGMA, and I forget exactly what that stands for, but it's something to do with mean salaries for academia in the present time. And then you can look at the standard deviation, 25 to 75. Um, and you know your salary that's being offered to you or your expectation should fall somewhere in that range as close to the median as possible and then accounting for cost of living. And there are lots of cost of living calculators that you can go online and find out a salary of say 100,000, or let's just make it bigger, $200,000 salary, um, say on the West Coast may be very different from that same salary um, when it's in say Alabama or it's in California. And so um, it's, it's not apples and apples at that time, you're comparing different things, but those are some of the things that I would say I would be ways to look at. I'd love to hear from you, Victor, what do you tell your people? Yes, start, uh, as I understood, I thought uh, the question, as I heard it, was about startup funding and salaries, a part of that. So uh, I didn't, um, I find it's easier to negotiate startup funding than it is salary. It's interesting because money would be money, but I find uh, some institutions are much more open about startup funding than they are about an extra $10 on salary. The ranges I see, um, if it's on the mean end, $50,000 spread over a couple years. It's not a whole lot. You might get a part-time research assistant and some statistical support for that and maybe some grant writing support. It's basically just enough to get you started. Sometimes I see three or $400,000 spread over several years. It sort of depends on the institution, the department, the candidate, but these are all just fellows coming out. These aren't people with a bunch of papers and a bunch of their own money. I see some people get $300,000 of startup money and then, of course, their salary is, you know, 225 and you ask for a little more salary. And, of course, they don't have any salary money, but they have $300,000 of startup money. So that's been my experience with uh, startup funding. You should ask for it. Um, if they say how much you're looking for, I always aim high. You know, I would say I would say you want to ask for at least 150000 spread over a couple of years and see what they say. Thank you so much. We have a second question um, from one of our attendees that says, I was told in academia, the schedule, uh, for example, days in clinic, research administration time is not written out explicitly in the contractor letter of intent. Is it sufficient to just send an email 
than saying, this is what we discussed, or how would you handle this? Um, so, I, go, go ahead. So, um, I, I would say that's probably not true, actually. So my first job out of fellowship was in academia, and my letter of intent explicitly said it, uh, a range of weeks of service and how many half days of clinic I would do. Um, I recently tra transitioned to this medical directorship, which is a brand new position. So my contract for this job did not include any hard and fast numbers. And that was really uncomfortable for me. Um, but their reasoning was, you know, we just don't know what to expect. And so we don't want to tie you down. And that required a lot of trust from me. And it was something that all of my mentors that I ran everything by were really concerned about. It's worked out really well for me. Um, but I think that if you're in academia and it's your first job, you should really have clear expectations either in the letter of intent and then eventually the contract. Yeah, I agree. Uh, they're not going to put, you know, Monday you're in clinic, Tuesday you're on service. They're not going to put that, but it has to be some percentages. Like you'll have, you know, 80% clinical time, 20% teaching and research time. You have to have some, some percentages there. Otherwise you have nothing and you show up and hope for the best. And the biggest dilemma is the person, the chairman that you talk to now, you talk to a chairman now and they're wonderful and they're trustworthy and they, they promise you all this stuff and they're probably going to deliver. But then by the time you get there next fall, that person's now like associate dean somewhere. There's a new chairman and they don't know any of this and you got nothing in writing. You, you have absolutely, I mean, hopefully you can, you can convince them but you don't want to be in that position the first day you show up and realize, oh, I'm in clinic five days a week. So the exact schedule is not going to be in a contract or anywhere, but you have to have some rough percentages, maybe 20 to 30 and 40 to 60, but you've got to have something. Otherwise, you can be fairly certain it's going to be tough to hold on to what, what you negotiated. Yeah, Absolutely. I would add one more thing is that during the time when you're interviewing and you're meeting different faculty at the same institution, that's a good time to ask each one of them that question of what is the typical clinical schedule for you? And you want to look at if the spread is fairly similar across all the answers or if there's a difference across all the answers. And if you find that there's a difference, then you can probe that particular faculty, not as in you were privy to somebody else's information, but more so is that pretty typical for everybody else? Um, and so they'll share more as to how they got to that schedule or how they negotiated. So that's sort of how you get a sense of consistency within that program. And then once you have that, I've been told this, and I've kind of I did it when I um, was in it, when I did my pick my first job. One of the things I was uh, told was that if you don't ask for a computer, uh, office computer or a laptop, you may not really get it. And so I asked that in the interviews. That's something you would do, and they said yes. So that when I did my uh, response thanking them, I actually you know had a couple of things in it, and one of them was I'm so excited that you're also going to get me a computer. It'll be my first official work computer. Um, and so, you know, yes, putting things in an email uh, where it doesn't read as a, you said this and more like a collaborative, you know, I'm expect, uh, this is what I heard. Um, and this is, please tell me if I got it right type of thing. That's a, definitely a good thing to do. Uh, thanks. Uh, next question is, um, how can we weigh home institutes offer versus an um, offer from the outside? Is the known devil better than the unknown? And how can you negotiate at your home institution? Um, you know, I've, I've heard both things. I've heard people say, I stayed at my home institution and people still look at me as a fellow. And then I also, he, like, I went to a different institution and I think it, um, it can be really lonely. There's no built-in residency class or fellowship class. There's no welcome wagon really. Um, and it's hard. Like you're, you're, you just don't really have a place. Everyone else is still going on with their lives. Um, so there's pros and cons to both, I think. Um, I think that if you're negotiating within your own home institution, maybe you have a bit of a leg up because you have so many other people that you can show your offer to if you're comfortable doing that and get advice from. Um, ideally, other people who are not stakeholders and who won't be threatened by your offer. 
I find it much harder uh, with clients to drive a bargain within your own institution than it is if you're being recruited somewhere else. You know, your own institution already has you. Um, you already live there. And in a sense, it's, it's safer, it's easier to stay, it's low risk. You already know everything and everybody. And I, I don't think they intentionally lowball you because of that, but uh, they don't have to really sweeten the pot to bring you halfway across the country because you're already there. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it means at least I think your ability to bargain is reduced somewhat from if you were being recruited to another institution. Um, <clears throat> I think I really resonate with this whole idea of the known devil versus the unknown uh, devil. Um, the, I, I agree with what both Sejal and Victor said. The, um, what I would also add is that you in wanting to stay at your own home institution versus needing to stay at your home institution, there's a difference. A want is when I like it, I have other options. Need is when I really need this, I don't have other options. So in your mind, you have to have the dialogue and figure out which where you are landing. And then if it's a situation where you're actually being pursued and you have multiple offers, you really like where you are, but you just don't know if the grass is greener elsewhere, right? That's sort of what you're trying to say. Am I missing out by saying no? And there is when really first, going back to some of the things both Sejal and Victor talked about, is really figuring out what is it that is of most value to you, not what is the most you're going to get out of any uh, job, but what's of most value to you and which job sort of aligns your top one, two, or three? Absolutely. If it happens to be your home institution, then that's great. If it happens to be another institution, then now you can negotiate and figure out if your home institution is willing to give you a little bit more. That's where transparency comes in. You know, I really like what I would love to stay here. I really like uh, what we already have. Uh, one of the attractions of going to program X is because that they're also saying that um, they will give me some extra support for this program that I want to start up because I'm really interested in taking care of X patient population. That's something that I did do. Um, and then so that allowed the local program to have a chance, like Victor said, to say, okay, I understand where you're coming from. Let me see what I can do to help you. So I hope that helps. But We have another question from the audience. Uh, could you give an example of what you meant when you said you have to have something on paper? Did um, I say that? Who said that? Be that? You. That'd be you, Victor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, the way the law works is that in most academic institutions, well, the way the law works is that the contract is the only thing that matters. And most contracts have a clause near the end that says entire agreement. It says this document and the attached exhibits are the entire agreement and nothing else matters even if it's in writing. So from a legal perspective, the contract and its attachments are the only thing that's legally binding. Um, so ideally we want it, and in, a, in an academic institution, it's usually a two-part document. There's something they call the offer letter, which is actually part of your contract. And then they staple like the standard terms to it. It's like 10 pages of just boilerplate about HIPAA and termination, malpractice insurance, all that stuff. So most academic places, it's a two-part contract. They're both part of the document and they're both legally binding. Anything else is not legally binding. So ideally, you want these things in, in the legally binding document, the contract, um, if you don't have that, then sometimes people do side letters. I see them like, well, we can put it in a side letter. Well, that's not legally binding, but most physicians, I don't think, realize that. So it's okay as, lo as long as lawyers don't get involved. So if somebody gives you a side letter between you and the chairman saying, I can't put this in the official contract, but I promise you, you'll have three weeks of this and two weeks of that. And they sign their name. Well, if I was a physician doing that, I would think it was legally binding. I put it in writing. I signed it. What do you mean? It's not? So, and it, you also have it. And if, if there's a question, you could say, hey, I remember last year you gave me that side letter. I, I just, you know, it, it said I didn't have to do that. And you can rely on it. And most people are going to honor what they put in writing, 
even if it's not legally binding, it's professional etiquette. You can't say, well, it's not legally binding. You can't force that on me. So I'm, I'm not going to honor what I said to you. Most people don't, don't want to do that in, in, in a professional environment. So ideally, by writing, I mean in the contract. Uh, but if you can get it in other forms, it's not legally as good, but sometimes practically it's your best option. Um, and sometimes what department chairman will do, especially your own chairman will say, well, you know, we have to trust each other on this. And uh, I can't put it in writing, but you have to trust me. Don't you trust me? And you can't say no. But what you should say is, yes, I do trust you. But what if you're not here next year when I show up? And in the event that happens, I need something in writing. Could you, could you please put something down that I have to rely upon? So ideally in a contract, but less than that, anything else that someone's willing to put down and sign, it's not legally binding, but it's practically helpful. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to rephrase this next question just a little bit, just to simplify it. Um, so the question is, how do you navigate um, offers or potential offers that are in different stages? And so you're about to get an offer from one place and you have another interview scheduled in a couple of weeks. Do you want me to take that, Samira? <clears throat> okay. So um, if you are running out of time, I would say don't be afraid to approach the um, employer who's giving you an offer or the one that you're waiting for an answer from. Um, what, you know, it's what I used one of the examples is that um, you, the person who sent you an offer, you can actually be transfer, transparent with them and let them know that you are waiting to hear from another institution or you're waiting to interview with the third institution. The real question is, in having something already on in hand, when you have option two or option three, is it that you really want that option two or three? And option one doesn't just line up as well? Or is it that you want to see what else it can offer? If it's the former where you really want the one that you still haven't interviewed at, you may be risking losing this job or passing up on this job to wait for that other one. That's your dilemma. That's the dichotomy. And that's where the stress comes in. You could actually give the person who's already given you an offer the chance to let them know that, um, you know, you like their offer, but you do not want to pass up this other potential job uh, possibility uh, in case there is, uh, um, there, there is something that, um, well, I'm saying this incorrectly. What I mean by it is that if you do, you 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 want, we want to say that I really want to make a comparative choice. This other institution is a little late. How much time do I have? Is there any way you can give me until and then give them the time? Give them. Can, is there any way you can give me until a month? And they'll come back and say, nope, we can only give you a week. You have your answer. Then you have to make your choice. Are you willing to let go of what you have for the possibility of something? Um, um, it, it is also likely uh, in a job market where there's supply and demand, for instance, in transplant nephrology currently, there are more jobs open than the people um, in applying for these jobs. So you're then in a power of negotiation and strength where if you give up on something, uh, waiting for something else, there is a chance that that may still be open and you can go back to it. Um, so again, if uh, what you're asking is if you had a crystal ball it would be easy. You don't. And so um, this would be the alternative way. But Victor, Sejal, do you have yeah. other ways you well, would respond to that? Yes, I, I agree with everything uh, Dr. Kumar said. And eventually you hit a wall on that. And then uh, and this is the lawyer in me talking. You have to drag it a little bit. The way you do that is you, they give you a deadline of Friday. So Wednesday or Thursday, right? Say, hey, uh, I was looking at the contract. I had a couple questions about the compensation or the bonus program or the promotion. Should I talk to you about that or should I go to the admin person? And then they write back a day later, say, talk to the admin person, say, okay, thank you. I will get back to you. Then I send an email to them. And then that takes them a couple of days to write back. And then I write back to the other person, say, hey, I got that question answered, but they said you knew this part. And you're basically dragging it. You're just dragging it. And I have found as long as you're constructively working towards agreement, um, they're not going to pull it out from under you. You're just asking a couple questions. 
Yeah, you're dragging it a little bit. You know, they write back to you and then you wait, they write back on Monday morning and you write back late on Tuesday. You got to do a little bit of that stuff, okay? And I don't know. I'm an, It's ethical to me. I'm a lawyer, though. I don't know if it's ethical for doctors, but, uh, you know, that's what you have to do. Um, and I have found that as long as you're communicating, they're not going to pull the offer from you. True. I'd like to ask uh, perhaps maybe our last question. We'll try to answer some of these other ones in the Q&A, perhaps in the chat. But this last one um, is for Dr. Tana. How long is long enough to decide whether the, the department or faculty is the right fit versus teething issues with moving to a new institute, department, or new place? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think it really depends on what the issues are. I think there can be some really egregious issues and probably time won't help with that. But for the most part, I would say you should probably, I would say closer to two years, but definitely more than one. I think if you leave the institution in less than a year, it'll really be a red flag that you'll be asked about on your CV for years to come. Um, you know, I, and I think one thing I, I wish I had known is when I joined a new institution, I kind of just said yes to everything, um, but I needed to make strategic yeses and strategic no's. Mm -hmm. I needed to go to my chart and look at are the things I'm saying yes to going to get me closer to my goals. Um, but before, I would say before two years, I was, people re really didn't know who I was and it just took a while for me to find my fit, my niche, um, I think, at my institution. I love that. Such a brilliant point. Strategic yeses and strategic noes. I'm still learning. <laughs> I think we have maybe time for uh, one more. Uh, Dr. Cotton, uh, do I have to hire a lawyer to review my contract or is a physician who is free mentor enough? <laughs> I think you're on mute. Uh, Dr. Khan, I think you're on mute. Thank you. I'm not plugging for lawyers here, uh, but here's the way I look at it. You worked 15 or 20 years to get here. It's a huge decision. You might be moving your family partway across the country. Uh, it's a lot of money relative to what you've had to this point. And although most contracts are pretty reasonable, um, you want to make sure that there's something there that you can, that what you were promised is there in writing that you can rely upon. And I'm looking at this, I'm sort of like asking a trauma surgeon what they think of motorcycles. Uh, trauma surgeons, they say, oh, no, no, don't, no motorcycles, please stay away, because they see all the people that get thrown off motorcycles. So I tend to see a lot of people that get thrown off of contracts, and they're pretty beat up when that happens. So my view is a little skewed here, but I, every couple of times a week, I, I have a call from somebody who's in some horrible contract and they're trying to get out of it and they're getting the short end of the stick at every turn. I think it's worth a little bit of money to make sure that the next stage of your career and your finances will be what you think and planned and were told they would be. But again, I, I hope that doesn't come across as a shameless plug uh, for lawyer services. I do think most lawyers um, do have a fellow or resident rate that makes it a lot more reasonable. Um, and I think the smaller your group or practice is going to be, the more inclined you should be to have a lawyer look over you. Yes. Them. Yes. All right. Uh, 30 seconds for one final question. Um, what items should people have in their contract before signing, such as salary uh, standard of living increase each year? Well, I think some description of your general duties, where you'll be working, practice location, relative time division, if there's financial, if there's research support. Um, a lot of your fringe benefits like retirement and such are important to know, but those are usually not in a contract because they're given to all employees within the institution, but it's nice to know what they are. And then the other key thing that's often overlooked are what I call terms of departure. If I want to leave, how much notice do I have to give? When, when can I give it? Where am I allowed to go? Is there a non-compete clause? How big is it? Will I have to leave this town? Um, who pays for malpractice tail insurance? It's required. Somebody has to pay for it when you leave. It can be very expensive, like twenty or $30,000. Somebody has to pay for it when you leave. You need to know who that is. And then you'll usually, if they give you any money coming in the door, like a signing bonus, they'll usually want some or all of that back if you leave within the first year or two. So you want to make sure that you got everything on the front end that you were promised 
but then make sure you understand the terms of departure, the things that are going to apply when you leave. We often overlook that. And then you can find um, be disappointed to learn that it's very expensive to, to, to quit a job that you don't even like. And that's a real road to burnout when that happens. All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you again to our three outstanding panelists. I think um, you all shared really invaluable advice and I hope our trainees and uh, junior faculty can take something away from this. Um, Brian, I will turn it over to you to close this out. Well, thank you so much. AST would like to thank Drs. Kumar, Tana, Cotton, Farooq, and Lair, and all of our attendees for today's excellent session. 